So welcome to our meeting today, um, our Sunday meditation and Dharma talk. And Adrian, you got the mic, I see, and ready to make some announcements. Yeah, sure. Can First of all, can everybody in the room hear me all right and people on Zoom as well? Great. Well, just a few announcements. You're joining us today on our regular Sunday meditation and Dharma talk. Today we have Ian Chalice. That's every Sunday, 4.30 p.m. to 6 p.m. You can either join us by sitting here in person at the UUCOD facility that we're renting right now, or you can join us through Zoom as well. Um, sometimes our teachers here in person, sometimes they're on Zoom, but either way you can join us in community in person or in community online. We also have our uh, Meditation as Refuge group, Zoom only, Tuesdays, 6.30 to 8 p.m. Valerie Cousson will be teaching this next one. Wednesdays, we have our peer-led Just Sit silent meditation. That is going to be 5.30 p.m. to 6.15, Zoom only. And Fridays, we have our Loving Kindness meditation. Uh, this week, it's going to be Ian as well. That's every Friday on Zoom, 4.30 p.m. to 5.15 p.m. And if you're here in person, you can uh, look over towards the doors you came in, and you'll see two baskets there. One is for the uh, teacher. Today, that's Ian, as I said. And one is for the facility. That goes towards you know, paying for our rent, um, paying for um, teacher mileage, all the expenses of life. And then the one for the teacher, of course, goes to compensate the teachers for the wonderful wisdom and care that they bring us. Uh, if you're on Zoom, you'll be able to see a couple of links as well um, for, for Donna, her donations. Um, we appreciate any generosity, whether that be financial, whether that be your um, skills, your time, volunteering. You'll also see a couple of email addresses there if you would like to volunteer your time and skills. We really appreciate it. You know, right now, times are a little rough all around, so we understand that, but we appreciate everything you can do for us. And uh, with that, I'll leave you to Ian. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Adrian, And thank you for all that you do and are doing to support our community <laughs> and bringing us back to see what's here and how it all fits together. And Adrian is our board president and we've, I've been serving with Adrian for eight, eight years at least, maybe nine. And yeah, thank you for your dedication. Um, and thanks everyone for being here in person or on Zoom. We're really glad you're here. It really does help to have <laughs> a few people in the audience. Uh, it's quite lovely, so thank you for making the effort to come in person because it, it really does help the speaker somewhat to have <laughs> people to speak to, uh, especially since otherwise I have to kind of look over my shoulder to see the folks on Zoom. And I'm very glad that you're with us too. So thanks folks on Zoom. And, uh, and we're going to move into a period of silent meditation and then we will um, talk about shame today, um, which uh, will be um, an interesting topic. <laughs> One of definitely my uh, painful emotions that uh, I've really been learning a lot about and um, looking forward to talking about, sort of. <laughs> There's part of me that wants to run away from it all the time, but we will examine shame today and how we might be able to practice with it using the tools of the Dharma, the teachings of the practice. So, um, so first, why don't we take some time to actually uh, actually sit together. And I want to sort of emphasize that sitting together, whether we're here in person in the room, whether we're, and of course we're in person when we're on Zoom too, but whether we're on Zoom or in the room, we are a Sangha. We are a group of people practicing together in community. And there is a huge amount of power in that. And we can draw strength from each other's presence. Just knowing that you are with others who want to practice, who care enough to practice, to take the time to stop, to settle, to listen to the heart, and to tap into stillness, tap into a moment that's outside the pulls and pushes of everyday culture and life. 
So just appreciating that for a moment, just that you're with others who also value this beautiful practice. And so in a few moments, we'll move into a silent period of about 25 minutes. And as we do that, I'll offer a few invitations or ideas for practice, and you're welcome to use them or just to practice as you already feel best or know best for yourself. But if you'd like a little direction or invitations, perhaps just first noticing the posture that you are in and seeing if you'd like to make any adjustments. And that's not to have the picture perfect posture by any means, but just finding what's comfortable, what's supportive for your body in this particular moment. How can I bring the sense of alertness and presence to this moment? So we want to be relaxed and also having some energy, some awakeness. And it's perfectly okay to meditate lying down if that's comfortable for you. Great to meditate sitting. If you're drowsy, you might like to stand or try that sometime at home. Just finding that posture. And then noticing how you are being held in this moment. Held by gravity, held by the chair, the floor, the cushion that you might be on, the earth at your feet. How you are held and welcomed by earth just as you are. And then at the most basic, our practice is really about staying awake to the present moment, noticing what's actually happening right now. So seeing if you can maintain or invite the light of awareness to be bright within you, noticing the breath, the movement of the breath in the body, or perhaps noticing the sounds in the room or wherever you are, or perhaps noticing the movement of thought in your mind, seeing if it's possible to just know what's happening right now without needing to change it or fix it, make it different but just noticing, simply bringing awareness. And maybe every once in a while, just asking yourself, am I aware? What am I aware of? As a way of bringing awareness back to the forefront. So I'll ring the bell one time as we move into our silent period and three times at the end. And I offer this beautiful verse from Sylvia Borstein that encapsulates the practice for me. May I meet this moment fully. May I meet it as a friend.
just every once in a while asking that question, am I aware in this moment? And what am I aware of?
in the last minute of our sit together, our meditation period, noticing how it was for you today, or how it is for you. And whether it's been easy or difficult or some of both, or maybe just neutral, just noticing and appreciating your efforts appreciating your willingness to explore, to see what's here in this moment. Thank you for your practice, and welcome to ICD's Month of Difficult Emotions. <laughs> um, and I'm going to talk about shame today, and how this came up for me as I'm involved in a, offering a retreat for queer folk up in the high desert at Damadena, and I'm on the teaching team, and, and we were getting together talking about like, okay, what are we going to cover and what do we want in the description? And my co-teachers wanted to put shame in there. Like, how do we hold and practice the shame? And I thought, wow, I don't know about that. <laughs> it doesn't sound very appealing to me. I think we might chase people away. Um, and kind of realized at that point, oh, maybe this is something I need to take a look at. And I have taken a look at it over the last couple of months, and I've come to realize that avoiding shame is actually one of the guiding principles of my life. It's one of the ways I organize what I do and what I don't do. And there's a documentary that David and I have been watching about this uh, queer designer guy in Buenos Aires, um, and it's called No Time for Shame. And I've been <laughs> kind of thinking, okay, let's have a little time for shame. So this is our time to take a look at shame and explore it together, um, creating a little space, maybe bringing it out of the shadows just a little bit. So, you know, when I say shame or when you hear that word, you know, I wonder what comes up for you just hearing that word? Is there a physical reaction at all? Is there some aversion, shame? You know, we have so many expressions for shame. Red with shame, hot with shame, dying of shame, flooded with shame. It's a pretty powerful word. And for me, it's really, I recognize one of the most intense emotions. I probably deal with it more than I deal with anger, for example. So this month, and we thought, well, let's look at the difficult emotions and how we might know them and work with them through the lens of Buddha Dharma. So I said shame and regret. It's actually going to be just shame today. So I regret to inform you, no regret. 
Um, and then next week, uh, Joe Kai will be with us and he'll talk about love and hatred. And uh, Mary will talk about grief and loss. And then we'll, the month will close with uh, Yushin talking about sadness and joy. So very full month. Um, but the question is, you know, the examination is, how do we hold these really powerful feelings that are a natural part of the human experience, but that we don't like all that much? How do we make space for what's difficult? And how does our practice, how do the Buddhist teachings resource us or give us tools so that we can be more at peace with what hurts? So the Buddha is famous for saying many times in different ways, I teach suffering and the end of suffering. He wasn't so interested in cosmology or metaphysics. He was interested in how do we suffer less and wh why do we suffer? So shame, regret, hatred, grief, loss, you know, these are places where a lot of human suffering is located. These are the places that it can be so difficult to inhabit, to relate to, sometimes even just to acknowledge or hear because we really, generally, I want to be anywhere than with them, with those difficult emotions. But at the same time, you know, that's not really possible because those emotions are naturally part and parcel of being human and we're going to experience them all through life. And we might learn how to be less afraid of them. We may learn ways of suffering less as we begin to know them as they are and hold our experience with more patience and compassion. So it's kind of like living here in the desert, you know, where there are diamondback rattlers and there are scorpions and there are tarantulas. And, you know, as long as I live here, I know that if I venture out on the trails that I will see these beings from time to time. They go with the land. This is their land. And I could shut down in fear of them or stay at home and never go outside. Um, I could deny and avoid their natural presence. Or I can choose to understand them uh, a little better, know their habits, understand their ways, know their locations, increase my understanding and respect of them so that when I encounter one of them, you know, I can behave in a way that's appropriate and less likely to lead to any harm. And this is a lot more skillful than if I rely only on my autonomic body response when I see a snake or a scorpion or a tarantula. Um, in the experience, the experiencing shame has a very pre-verbal component for me. There's that rush, you know, that being flooded, that sense of wanting to just fall through the floor. And to me, it feels like not unlike those first moments of encountering a snake along the trail, physical, visceral, um, you know, and it takes some time for me to even know, oh, this is shame, because my response is usually to run from the discomfort, run from the situation as quickly as I can. So it's a really raw emotion. And research shows what we know. In a moment of shame, logical thinking is often offline. And there's this physiological urge, urgent urge, for self-protection. So one researcher on shame, Dr. Gerald Fishkin, writes, shame isn't associated with cognition at all. At the precise moment shame is triggered, we are emotionally hijacked and there's no prefrontal activity. We automatically want to be anonymous and invisible. Kind of rings true for me. Emotionally hijacked. The, that's the dukkha of shame, the, the suffering of shame. So it's interesting to, to kind of reflect on the power of the physical experience of shame and then to look at its cause a little bit. Because shame is tricky. Because of that desire that we have to get away from it, to become anonymous, invisible, it doesn't really invite us to look very deeply, to examine it. And I tend to want to put as much distance as I possibly can between me 
And that moment of shame or that feeling of shame, I don't want to look at it. I want to run away from it. And as soon as I have some safe distance from it, I would prefer to pretend it just never happened. So we know it comes in a lot of different flavors and colors. And at the core, in the Buddha's way of identifying the three root poisons of greed, hatred, and delusion, you know, it's very much hatred or aversion, self-aversion, a sense of being unworthy, of being found deficient and not worthwhile, of not being lovable, of not belonging. And most of us don't need that disapproval to come from the outside, from other people. We judge ourselves and, and we imagine what others must be thinking or seeing. You know, we imagine and internalize their judgment or dominant culture's judgment or the ghosts of judgment past, the ghost of judgment from our parents, teachers, bullies, you know, even our peers. And underneath that sense of unworthiness is that sense that we're broken, we're not right, we're not deserving of love and connection. I think this is totally <laughs> a difficult emotion when you put it that way. I mean, how much more difficult can it be? And it's a hindrance not only to our happiness, but it's also a hindrance to our practice. And when I started meditating on a regular basis, shame was my biggest um, enemy, basically. You know, I noticed again and again, every time I went to sit on the cushion, waves of shame and regret that would literally propel me off the cushion and be like, I don't want to be with this at all. Which I think was a good clue that maybe this is something I really need, needed to look at and still do. So for me, like aversion as a hindrance really shows up heavily with shame. I'm not okay. I'm not capable. I'm intrinsically flawed. Or I'm an imposter. I will be found out. And you can't imagine how <laughs> common that is for people who offer Dharma talks, for example, or do public speaking, that lurking fear that all of my negative self-assessments are actually true, and you see it so clearly. So sitting here is an incredibly vulnerable place to be. It's, uh, it's an edge, for sure. That fear of shame and humiliation is also, I notice, an incredible motivator. It works because I will go to huge lengths to avoid feeling shame. It really works as a motivator. But then I look at what cost, at what cost is this working? Is this how I want to live? Is this how any of us want to live? Making choices and acting motivated by the fear of judgment motivated by the fear of feeling shame. It feels like the exact opposite of where creativity lives to me. So what is this energy? You know, It's both powerful and a little slippery because shame likes to hide. And it's so unpleasant that you know when that activated shame state has passed, you really don't want to go back there anymore. I know I'd rather do anything than recall moments when I felt exposed or humiliated or laughed at. And yet the conditioning is still there, activated or not, examined or not, ready to pop up. So hopefully when we start looking at this and put it into words, or use words, use language, it can be easier to see, to get a grasp of, and of course, you know, nothing, no emotion is solid, but we might be able to understand it better the more we talk about it, which is a lot to ask sometimes. So the, the research says that shame is actually a relatively late and uniquely human emotion. And as soon as I read that, I'm like, wait, dogs feel shame. I know they do. But then I looked into that, and apparently scientists don't believe dogs really feel shame. They believe that dogs 
make a face that makes us feel sorry for them because we think they're experiencing shame. <laughs> but it's mostly, at least in humans, about the fear of being disconnected from others because of behaviors that fall outside of group norms. And as social animals, being cast out or, or rejected from the group is incredibly vulnerable and dangerous. So it's a kind of self-awareness of how we're fitting in, how we're seen. And the pain of shame is actually a negative motivator to keep us from doing something that might cause us to get cast out or targeted. And the interesting thing about this is that research also shows that it isn't related to our own sense of right and wrong, to our conscience, to what we really believe, but that we feel shame about transgressing group norms, whether we share the norms or not, whether we really believe in them or not. So this makes so much sense as a queer person, the internalized shame that we have because we've absorbed these norms. And in our hearts we know there's nothing wrong with this, there's nothing wrong with who I am and yet we feel that shame. So, so much of what we feel about shame is received. We're conditioned to feel shame based on our culture and our caregivers, and then we internalize that voice so that we're inflicting the pain on ourselves, even when there's no one watching. You know, and we all know those voices. And there's a big difference between guilt, which is more like, oh, wow, I'm so sorry about that. I'm sorry I did that. I can see it caused harm. I'd rather not do that in the future. And then shame, which is more, I'm a really bad person. I'm defective or deficient, and I'm never not going to be this way. So shame isolates us and separates us from others. We want to hide, disappear. And guilt might actually lead us to make amends. It actually might lead us to connect with people. So I, I said, and I want to talk about how we practice with this. And at the same time, I really also want to spend a little more time naming shame because I don't think that we do that all that much. I know I haven't. Because for something that's common to the human experience, you know, it seems like we don't talk about it all that much. I think that's changing. But we know how it feels, hot, bitter, red, paralyzing, crippling. And it comes in so many flavors, you know. Unreflected attempts at connecting, unwanted exposure, a big one for me, being excluded or left out. And there are so many ways that we are shamed by others or receive and internalize these messages of shame in this culture. I remember, you know, very first time, a very early recollection of being shamed was around being sensitive. You're too sensitive. Your heart's too open is basically what that meant to me. Um, and then there's all the varieties of shame, body shame and gender shame and race shame and financial shame. Shame about achievement or failure. Right? Shame about our abilities or lack of them. You know, for those of us who are neurodivergent, you know, and experience things differently mentally, you know, shame around that. Queer shame. Shame around aging. We have shame around our own aging bodies. Shame about what we feel. Shame about how we express ourselves. What interests us. You know, that we're just not right. These subtle forms. You know. We can even have shame about how we communicate, that we talk too much or that we don't talk enough. And our very, very basic human needs can be shamed. You know, when you get down to it, it's, it's that shame of being human. What is a crazy thing that we... <laughs> that we buy into and the shame of being human. All the ways that we get othered and diminished and dismissed and 
And really the word colonized, I think, is really appropriate here. We get colonized by the energies that want to control us. And shame is a tremendously effective means of doing that. We get colonized because we internalize the voices of shame from our childhood and then effectively continue the work of those shaming voices for them, isolating ourselves, dividing ourselves, undermining our confidence. It's like a virus, really. And as I thought about this, I I heard my teacher and friend, Irina Weissman, saying, if it's not kind, it's not true. If it's not kind, it's not true. We'll explore that a little more later. But it's pretty true that there's nothing accurate in this kind of shaming, nothing that really benefits us. So rather than encouraging our highest intentions and wishes of connection and care and growth, we actually become isolated and paralyzed and say no to the beauty that's within us. And in a moment of shame, when shame gets triggered, without mindful awareness, which we develop in this, on this path, in this practice, we're not able to see the other except through the projection of what they must be thinking, what our patterns of shame are believing in that moment. So rather than being able to connect and focus on both both of our needs and experience in that moment, all we can see is our own. So we're crippled and limited in those moments. We're unlikely to be able to work skillfully when we're gripped by shame and we don't even see it. So this is the suffering that arises from aversion, the pain of feeling that internal disapproval, that internal abandonment, because that's also what happens. We abandon ourselves the complete opposite of unconditional love. So I want to make a little aside here um, and then come back to how we can practice with this. Because you know, those of you who have been practicing Dharma for a while and coming to Dharma talks may have come across the teachings on Hiri and Otapa, which the Buddha called the guardians of the world. And these are translated usually and archaically, but persistently, as shame and moral dread. So, <laughs> which I find really unhelpful. <laughs> because really what this teaching is about is not shame, but healthy remorse, a sense of conscience, or ethical integrity. And these are connected, not isolating like shame. So when the Buddha called these out as guardians of the world, is in the sense of enabling us to understand right and wrong and the impact that our actions have on ourselves and each other. So Ajahn Sujato, an Australian monk, calls Hiri the inner quality that protects one from doing things that are unwholesome. That's our conscience, that's our integrity. And Otapa has the understanding, the sense of understanding the effects that harmful actions will have. So it's really another talk in and of itself, but I wanted to touch on it because that archaic translation is still widely used. And just to underscore that the, the fact that shame, as we use the word nowadays, has no place in the Buddha's teachings because it's self-aversion and delusion, which is practically a trifecta of the three poisons. So what we're really talking about is that sense of caring, of connectivity and justice that moves us toward the greater good, not self-interest, small self-interest, but the what's truly in our self-interest, our wider interest, the inner voice of our Buddha nature, what connects us to people. And that couldn't be further from that crippling, hot sense of shame.
And I think that has a direct bearing on how I respond when I cause harm or when I can tell harm has been caused because someone says, ouch. And if I'm caught in shame, this incredibly uncomfortable feeling, I'm concerned with my pain and wanting to get out of this as soon as possible. But without that sort of judgmental shame, I can focus on what the situation is really asking of me, how to respond in this moment to this human being from a place of caring. So if we're, you know, if I get in an argument and that shame energy becomes triggered and I don't see that happening, then not only am I believing in that moment that I'm wrong or defective in some way, but that you are making me wrong and you're wrong for making me feel this way. So it <laughs> it's n not an easy place to, uh, to connect from at all. And I think, you know, I was reflecting too, oh, this is what comes up so often for white people, people in the dominant culture, when we get into conversations around race, there's that shame. This is incredibly uncomfortable. I don't want to be in this. It must be somebody's fault that I'm feeling this way. So, but in the Buddha's teaching, none of us are intrinsically wrong. None of us are damned. None of us deserve to feel this difficult emotion that we call shame. It's just part of inhabiting this human body and having this human brain. Um, at this point, pretty much every Dharma teacher <laughs> brings up Angulimala, who murdered 999 people, it says in the, in the ancient teachings. And he was about to murder the Buddha. And um, he didn't. The Buddha talked him out of it and uh, got him interested in something other than killing. And of course, he became enlightened. You know? <laughs> so even somebody who has killed 999 people and wore a string of their fingers around his neck uh, was not outside of the Buddha's teaching and the Buddha's care and the possibility of healing and wholeness. So um, my teacher, I, I didn't ever sit with her in real life, but I've read tons of her books. <laughs> um, Aya Kema uh, has a formula for you know how we behave when we've when we're caught in something that isn't working, something unpleasant. And it's recognize, no blame, change. Recognize, no blame, change. In other words, you know, see what's happening. Let go of the shaming and blaming and focus on the appropriate response in this moment from this place of connection. And of course, you know, making whatever amends are necessary when we've harmed another being. Very different from guilt. Yeah. Oh, sorry I did that. What can I do now? You know, that's, that's healthy. That's easy. That's connecting. Shame is saying, I'm bad. I'm horrible. Or you're bad. Or shame worthy. And that's what we run from. Okay, so now how do we hold shame in the context of the Dharma, in the context of our practices that we come here and, and learn and work with together? And of course, you know, it can be tremendously helpful to work with a, a therapist or talk to friends about our shame. How do I work with it as an expression of my practice? So first step is don't shame the shame. Don't shame the shame. It's okay that it's happening. Remember that this sense of shame that we feel is hardwired. We've evolved to feel it. It's in place as a defense against acting in ways that might result in disconnection from the group. It's a bit of pain to remind us of the life-threatening pain of being exiled. So some of us also feel it more than others, depending on our age and our upbringing. So interestingly, 50 to 59 is supposed to be the sweet spot. And I'm going to turn 60 in October, so we'll see. <laughs> 
But I thought that was really interesting. We feel it in our youth, particularly, and in our teen years a lot, and then sort of in our middle years, not so much. And then again, as we age, as we're really noticing the effects of age. So that first step, don't shame the shame. Recognize that it's natural. And remember that shame thrives in secret. So can I start being aware of shame when I feel it and not run from it? That's a huge step, simply naming it. Now this is the third foundation of mindfulness that the Buddha taught, being aware of our mind states. We can be aware of our bodies, we can be aware of sensation, and we can be aware of our mind states. So that's a core practice. What is my mental emotional state in this moment? So shame is such an uncomfortable mental state that paying attention to it actually feels like the last thing we may want to do. And yet, you know, it's the key to working with it or any of the difficult mind states we encounter. And I want to stay there for a moment because the ability to be with what's uncomfortable is key to our practice. And we can't just stay with joy and stillness and peace all the time as much as we love those things because that just isn't the way that life unfolds. That isn't how it is to have a human mind and body and heart. And for some of us, any attention feels shaming because we doubt our worth. You know, a number of years ago, I was asked by this Sangha to serve as its guiding teacher. And I agreed, even though it was way out of my comfort zone at the time. I'd barely been teaching a year. And then my dear friend, Beth, um, who was the outgoing guiding teacher, uh, marked the occasion at a Sunday meeting in our old space. And we had a lot of people that day, 50 or 60 people. And there was music, and there was dancing, and ceremony, and scarves, and all kinds of stuff. And I can't tell you the shame that I felt in that moment from the attention as lovely as the gesture was, and as much as I love and appreciate that dear friend, and as supportive a ceremony as it was for the Sangha, all I could focus on was me. You know, that internalized voice of shame that said, you're an imposter, you're unworthy. If they don't know now, they'll know soon enough. And I still struggle with this emotion, but it's only through recognizing the presence of shame that I can begin that healing process, that I can even take a step in that direction. Otherwise, it's just something, oh, it's happened again. And the fear of it runs my life. So can I not shame the shame and can I not shame myself for having it? And I recognize that this is part of being human. And having made some room, you know, and making some room sometimes is just simply naming it and not running away. Can I hold it and the experience of it in a new way? Because that's what the Dharma is about. Recognizing what's here in this present moment, seeing it as clearly as we possibly can, and changing our relationship to it based on that seeing. So if a friend came to you and told you their deepest places of shame and regret, what would be your response? I think I hope that my response would be welcoming, appreciative of their courage, and also not rushing past it's uncomfortable to try and get somewhere else. I'd want to listen fully without judgment and without adding any further shame by dismissing the feeling or minimizing the experience. Working with shame is like working with all difficult emotions, bringing that light of awareness to the experience of whatever it is without judgment 
without rushing, bearing witness with patience. You know, a, a question I came across last week, I, I, and I don't know where, but beautiful. Do we believe that not paying attention to suffering will diminish pain? Do we believe that not paying attention to suffering will diminish pain? It's an interesting question to reflect on. I know there's times in my life when I have believed that. So appreciating the strength of vulnerability, you know, to show another our places of shame is incredibly brave and incredibly vulnerable. And to show those places to ourselves is sometimes maybe even braver. So some of you may know the work of Dr. Brene Brown, who has done a lot of work, groundbreaking research on connection, shame, vulnerability, um, written books and amazing TED Talks. And she points out the strength in vulnerability, really highlights that, and how we fear expressing it as weakness. And yet when we see someone expressing vulnerability, we see the strength in that. You know, and I, I wonder, like, you know, when I admit my shame, when I admit my difficult places, the places where I've really struggled, you know, does that make me seem weaker? I don't feel weaker having done it. What happens when I share my vulnerable places with someone I trust? So, um, let me skip over a little bit here, but uh, coming back to that question, you know, as we create space around this experience of shame, noticing how does it feel somatically in the body? What's the mental response to it? What's the condition of my heart around this? And then that question, is it true? You know, the feeling is true. The feeling is true, but is the story true? And if it's not true, then how does my relationship to the story change, or how might it change? And this is part of the core teaching of the Buddha as well. We recognize it, we see it, we understand it, and we see what else is possible in that space of understanding. It was pointed out to me that our inner critic, that inner voice of shame, is incredibly loud, and that the inner nurturer is often very hard to hear. And so we can encourage that voice. We can choose to bring the light of awareness to that voice, to amplify that voice, to practice that voice, that voice that knows our deep worth, that delights in the beautiful in us and in all beings, the voice of our divine self, if you want to call it that, or our Buddha nature, or our original face. You know, we can reclaim our innocence. We can reteach ourselves our loveliness, as the poet Galway Kinnell says. May I accept myself in this moment. May I accept myself as I am in this moment. May I accompany this experience with kindness. May I feel my own care. May I be able to receive it. Bell Hooks writes about love having no love knowing no shame. Love knows no shame, she writes. And that's what we practice in the metta groups on Friday. Love without shame, unconditional love, opening our eyes to love. So I wanted to close with a poem by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And it's from his beautiful book called The Book of Forgiving that he wrote with his daughter. Meet me here. Speak my name. I am not your enemy. I am your teacher. I may even be your friend. 
Let us tell our truth together, you and I. My name is anger. I say you have been wronged. My name is shame. My story is your hidden pain. My name is fear. My story is vulnerability. My name is resentment. I say things should have been different. My name is grief. My name is depression. My name is heartache. My name is anxiety. I have many names and many lessons. I'm not your enemy. I am your teacher. So let's just sit for a couple of moments and let the words wash over and check in with body, heart, and mind for a moment. And then we'll open the floor. Thank you, and uh, thank you for your uh, kind attention. I know that was a little longer than my <laughs> normal Dharma talks. And so. so I think we're at our close for today, and I just want to thank everyone for being here in Zoom, in the room, however you show up, people who might be listening <laughs> on YouTube later. Thank you all for your practice and caring enough to... Um, to practice and to want to practice. And so it's traditional to share the merit, um, share the, the good that we have created together with others, with all beings. So I'll just offer a brief blessing that the good that we are contributing to, and the good that we love and bring into being, the care that we show to other beings, May it flower and ripple out in every direction. And may it touch beings in every way, in all places. May all beings know peace, and may all beings be free. Thank you.